Hello everyone. My name is Mona Firstenau, and I'm so sorry I can't be with you today as you explore the theme Invisible to Indispensable. I was so excited when Lutherans for Life chose this theme because it is perfect for the population that is near and dear to my heart and the passion that I have around creating space and places of belonging for people with disabilities and their families in the life of the church and in the body of Christ. I come to this work through a long interest in people that are marginalized by difference in disability, I have a degree in speech pathology, and I worked in that field for about 15 years. And then I had my children, both of whom are extremely differently gifted, and uh, they have been my biggest teachers in this journey on disability advocacy. And so as I share with you today some of my favorite foundational scriptures and some thoughts I've had and borrowed from other professionals, uh, I hope it will spark some curiosity in you and perhaps answer some questions as well. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I believe we're going to have a call-in Q&A, so you can ask an, any questions you'd like, and I'd be happy to try and answer them. Uh, there is a resource slide at the very end of the PowerPoint that uh, refers to those people that I'm borrowing information research and comments from and also a way to contact me. And so I hope that this is both enjoyable and thought-provoking for you as we explore this theme. I'll talk to you on the other side. And so let's begin with our topic for today. So often marginalized, yet indispensable in the body of Christ. I'd like to lay some groundwork first with one of the foundational scriptures I use in my work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, Psalm 139. And I know it's a favorite in Lutherans for Life as well, and let's just refresh ourselves about God's word. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. I love this verse because it really speaks to the sanctity of all life, of every life, of each life. No one is less than another to God. God calls everyone to minister in his kingdom. And everyone's abilities and experiences uniquely equip them for the work he has for them to do. So our witness to and with and from people with disabilities or suicide survivors or post-abortion or at end of life informs what we do when we celebrate God's handiwork and that each of us is fearfully and wonderfully made. I know you've all read or been exposed to multiple times this wonderful picture of the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12 and our theme, Invisible to Indispensable, um, shows up in verse 22, but I'd like to lay the groundwork again and just context for the whole conversation uh, around being indispensable and what does that mean. So I'm going to read uh, this with you. I'll read the black and when you see the green if you would join me so that we're all speaking these words together as part of the body of Christ. I'll try not to go too fast. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? 
If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So if indeed we're made for connection and everyone has a place and a role and a purpose, how do we create that safe space for those who are not yet a part of our local community of believers, our faith community, our local body of Christ? There are a number of things that we'll explore, but I want to just set the stage a little bit here talking about that creating a safe space. Everyone who approaches or is invited needs to have an unconditional welcome, a feeling of favorable reception, no matter who they are, where they come from. And those in your faith community or your network or your family or your church who are inviting others in need to communicate an authentic desire to know the hopes and the dreams and the needs of each person. Remember, each person that God placed specifically as he chose. And he made them for connection and role and purpose in your community. So they're not just, in quotes, a family with a disability or post-suicide or post-abortion. Each member has their own interests. They each have their own talents and gifts and experiences to share. And if we identify them quickly, they will begin to feel that connection and that safe place. And each one needs to feel that they are a necessary part of God's family. And we can communicate that to them if we do some simple things. And I wonder, as I think about all these wonderfully created, fearfully and wonderfully made humans that pass through our lives, I wonder what if the gospel message lived out and shared by all people, not in spite of, but because of their lived experiences, somehow makes that gospel message more accessible to people who would not otherwise hear it or listen or receive it. I love the story of Moses because it's a great example of a person who themselves didn't think that they could do what God was asking them to do and how God responds and answers to all of his objections. I call it God calls and Moses but. We find this story in Exodus chapter three and four and I'll just share a few of the highlights with you. God calls Moses from the burning bush and says, come. And Moses says, oh, but who am I that you would call and ask me? And God says, but I'll be with you. And Moses says, oh, but what do I say? I wouldn't know what to say. And God lays out a plan for him. And Moses says again, but, and now it's, 
they won't believe me. And so God lays out specific object lessons showing how he will give him the necessary tools for each objection that Moses is raising. And Moses listens to all of that plan and then says, but I'm slow of speech. And I love this part because God says, I know I made you go and I will help you. Moses still says, uh, but send someone else, please. So God gives Moses a helper because he chose Moses. And this was the job he had for Moses to do. And he chose his helper, Aaron, because that was to be the role and job for Aaron. That together God would use these wonderfully and fearfully made men to lead and share his people and share his story. So when we're talking about people with difference who come through the door in your congregation or even just beginning to try and plan for it to be a safe place for people with difference to come and be part of your community, your family, your network, your activity, your event, your church, Many times we feel uncomfortable. So let me share a few things with you. Congregations especially have a way of doing things sort of the way we've always done them. They like things that are familiar and a person with a difference is unfamiliar and so it makes you uncomfortable. They might lack experience with a person who is has a disability or is traveling uh, the post-suicide attempt journey or survivor of a uh, family member of someone who's um, suicide, who is suicidal. They might have negative experiences because of those, uh, because they had some of those experiences, or they might just lack information, have a lot of unknowns for them around this particular person of difference. They're unsure what to say. And so often when they don't know what to say, they say nothing. Or they lack confidence and seem tentative and then don't come across as genuine and authentic. They're just simply unsure how to act. These are very normal, natural responses to difference. We all do that to one degree or another. Here's some real handy ways to start to give people permission. Number one, you'll see this throughout my work. Just ask. Don't make an assumption about anything or presume anything. Just ask directly the person or the family. And you can even start out by saying, I don't know how to ask you this and I don't want to offend, but right, fill in the blank. You can gather as a group disability or topic specific resources. So Lutherans for Life has many great resources around abortion and um, end of life and all of those things that you can use, but there are a myriad of other resources around. You can get other resources specifically about specific disabilities. If this person who comes as a wheelchair user and has cerebral palsy and uses a communication device, you can get information about what to do and how to interact um, respectfully with this person of difference. Give everyone in your congregation permission to say, I don't know what to say. And it might even be useful to have them practice it. I don't know what to say in this situation. Help me walk through it together. And always, if you have some leaders that can model that unconditional, positive regard, respectful language, and pointing out common ground, not difference, that's a great place to begin. I had the opportunity last spring to go to Nashville and attend a Q Ideas conference. It's sort of a three days crammed full of TED Talk kinds of, of speakers, Christian focused in the workplace and the world of business and entertainment and how to um, address the current problems and issues, media, etc. And Senator Ben Sass, a Republican from Nebraska, was there and he gave a short eight minute talk about the epidemic of loneliness. Um, and he believes that there is this epidemic of loneliness in the, our country and it's due to disconnect. So he suggests there's a disconnect in community of place. 
people don't live in the same community or even in the same side of town uh, for very long. And so there's a disconnect whenever there's a shift in community of place. And then there's a community of workplace and and many people used to work in one job or with one company for many years, for decades even. Um, the new data shows that in not too distant future, people will move jobs every four years, which then is a disconnect of the people you've gotten to know in the workplace um, and the work that you do and the networks, the natural supports that you have within those that environment, that community of workplace. And because of these moves across town and because of these moves to different states and because of these shifts in work, there's a disconnect and a loss of friendship. He says there's a connection disconnect, if you will. And he says it's largely to, he lays the blame largely on the digital world. You don't have to be where you are. You can be in your living room in your pajamas and zooming in to a meeting in Japan or South America or across town, right? We can skim the surface. We don't have to go very deep because we don't have long-term relationship, authentic relationships, long-term um, and accountability that comes with that. We can be free from all of those responsibilities and accountability to others, and we can move on whenever we want. It gives us permission to disengage. And folks, this was in 2019, so this is a whole year before COVID. Then came COVID. And now, oh my gosh, it just has exacerbated all of these disconnects. The epidemic of loneliness and isolation resulting increased suicide, increased mental health issues, increased feelings of desperation, lack of control or choice. And my response to that, and maybe yours too, is we can do something about that. The church can help. To raise my hand and say the church can help. We have the answers. But I wonder if we really know what the question is. I think the question is about belonging. In the next few minutes of my time with you, I'm going to share some research by Dr. Eric Carter of Vanderbilt Kennedy Center in Nashville. He's a leading researcher on faith and disability, but his research really prompts him to write practical resources based on the research outcomes he's found. So what I'm going to share with you are outcomes from about 500 families he worked with of young people, people ages 13 to 20. And he discovered a similar uh, pattern emerging around dimensions of belonging. So they researched what does belonging mean to you and, and what, what things are important to you and how do you know when you belong. And so he's come out with uh, 10 essential dimensions of belonging. It's important to note before we dig into these and unpack them a little bit, belonging is not something granted by the host, but a feeling on the part of the guest. So let's unpack. Here are the 10 dimensions of belonging that Dr. Carter's research discovered and, and shares and defines a little bit. They include being present, being invited, being welcomed, being known, and being accepted, being supported and cared for and befriended and needed and loved. Let's unpack each one a little bit because I think as we look about how can we create a safe space for people with difference, whatever that difference may be, in our networks, communities, families, faith communities, churches, neighborhoods, when we look at difference and how to create a safe space and a welcoming space and a place where people feel they could belong, we'll soon come to see that the research that Dr. Carter's done with families with disability really describes universal, universal, universal dimensions of belonging. 
So let's check them out. The first one is about being present. You can't belong if you're not present. And remember, Senator Sass talked about a disconnect with community. If you're not there, you can't be part of the community. So if no one is there but you to represent whoever you are, person of color, person of disability, person post-abortion, person uh, suicidal, end of life, if nobody is there but you to represent, it will not feel like a place for you. This is a bit of a conundrum. It's a chicken and the egg sort of thing. How can you invite and create a space that feels safe for someone who's a wheelchair user and uses assistive communication if there's nobody else like that there? We'll talk about it a little bit and unpack it a little more. But that disconnect of community and with the community and that loneliness that results can be addressed and can be very inviting when people are present among others who are who represent the same groups that they do so that disconnect from workplace and that disconnect from friendship that senator sass talked about really is because they aren't present very long or even now with covid at all other than virtually um, and so people are seeking connection. They're longing for belonging. The second dimension is invited. And this is really about being specifically asked. Not you should come sometime, but specifically asked. And some of the Barna research and Pew research says that more than 10, 9 of 10 unchurched people said they would come to church if they were invited by someone they knew, but only if they had heard you talk about your church previously and you had previously invited. So it's not going to happen on the first time and they want to hear a little bit more about you and why you're excited about where you go to church and what you do or your life chapter or your um, uh, outreach to the homeless. They want to hear your excitement about that before you ever invite them. And then it needs to be an intentional invitation. Like I said, can't just be, oh, you should come sometime. But we're having a special introductory session activity for people interested in helping with our uh, pregnancy counseling center support bags. We're going to stuff bags with um, information and uh, small nice things for moms, expectant moms. And um, would, I'd love for you to come and just meet the others who are passionate about life as well. And we can just do it in this very informal, casual activity of packing bags of items for pregnant moms. The other thing the invitation is has to be personal, not just a generic, oh, anybody can come, but I really want you to come and see what we're doing. I really want to share this with you. I'm excited for you to learn about this. So specifically asked, very intentional and very personal. Invited. So the third dimension is welcomed, and it's really not enough that all the signs or the mugs or the bulletins say all are welcome. What do you do when someone comes in the door? How do they know they're welcome? Well, you introduce them to others. So you have hospitality folks that really excel at just being gracious and delightful and welcome people in so that they do feel welcome and introduce them to others. Invite them to share about themselves. Oh, what brought you here today? But uh, how can I'd love to connect you with someone? What kinds of things does your family enjoy or do you like to do so that you can connect them with others that have a, a shared interest? And each person is approached with a we are so glad you are here attitude. That's welcome can't tell you how many churches I've gone to and it says all are welcome but I spent much of the morning without anyone approaching me or even saying hello um, and as I travel across the country working with churches so this is don't underestimate how important it is but the specifics that really say welcome not just the greeting hello at the door but introduce to others and ask finding out a little bit about who they are so that they can be connected to someone. 
The next dimension is known. And especially in this disconnect of community of place and workplace and uh, COVID and virtual, etc., people can be in meetings or attending or working with or for quite some time without really getting to know anything about the person they're connected with. So being known is really crucially important to these young people who, who are participating in the research project. How do you get to know someone? You ask them questions. What or who brought you here today? Remember the answers they give you. Pay attention, remember the answers. And then seek to find points of connection. Who else do you know that you could connect them with who either has an interest in what brought them here today or um, is another person who knows the person that they know, right? Find points of connection. And afterwards, seek them out after the event, after the, the bag stuffing with activity with uh, items for moms. Uh, seek them out afterwards and how that feel? What felt good to you? What resonated with you? Just learning more about you. I just want to know how you felt about that. I'm trying to find other ways that we might, or other, other activities you might enjoy. Get to know them. The next dimension of belonging is being accepted. So we started the session today talking about Psalm 139, which says we are all God's children. We're all fearfully and wonderfully made. Therefore, all of us to each other need to have an unconditional positive regard for each person. And our 1 Corinthians 12 talked about how we're all part of the body of Christ. We have to communicate. We've been waiting for you. There's a gap, a hole. We know that you have something that we need. We've been waiting for you. And if we come at every person of difference who comes into our arena and sphere, if we look at that difference, that usually makes us uncomfortable or might just make us pause and think. If we look at that difference and remember, it's created by the creator. He tells us that in Psalm 139. David tells us that. And he tells us again in 1 Corinthians 12, that verse 18 was the verse that said, God has placed each one just as he chose. There's a role and a purpose and intention and plan for everyone. And that difference that makes us uncomfortable or makes us pause was created by the creator. So if we can communicate to that person of obvious difference, you are just what we need here. That's huge. Goes a long way towards feeling accepted in that moment. The next dimension of belonging is supported, being supported. And this doesn't have to be some big, grandiose, multifaceted plan of support. You can start with asking about visible support needs. If someone comes in with a white cane or comes in using a wheelchair, it's a very obvious place to start. How can we support your family? Do you have everything you need? Is there anything we can do? And again, as I said previously, after the ev event or fact or you've done whatever they've asked you to do, ask, how do we do? Can you describe your experience for us? Is there a way that we can make this more comfortable, more successful for you? I think we're not very big in the world of ministry in doing exit interviews about why people leave. I think we're because we're uncomfortable and we don't really want to hear what it is that we did or what it is that wasn't done or we just we really just don't want to hear why around someone leaving or not coming back or something like that. I think it's really important. It's a learning opportunity for us. If we ask, how do we do? Any barriers to your participation today or feeling successful today? And what can we do for the next time you come? Guaranteed they'll have something to suggest. But also guaranteed they aren't often asked that question. And just the act of asking the question helps them feel supported.
So the next dimension is of belonging is feeling cared for. Authentic relationship. If you think back a little bit to those uh, questions we ask about um, and the dimension of belonging about being known, if we think back to that and asking questions, authentic questions um, about what they enjoy and what their gifts and talents are and connecting them with others who might have a similar interest or connection, um, that authentic, that's authentic caring. Make sure that people are connected with others that, that they might enjoy and get to know. Right? We want them to notice when they're there. Oh, hey, you're here today. That's great. So glad to see you. But we also want them to know they're missed when they're gone. And I think this is another area of ministry that could use a huge boost across the country, across denominations, across ministry uh, contexts, is letting people know they're missed when they're gone without any kind of guilt trip or blame. Just saying, hey, I noticed you weren't there. I missed you. That goes a long way towards feeling recognized, known, cared for, accepted. Many of those previous dimensions we discussed. And being cared for is active. It's not just, oh, you know, see you every Sunday when you walk in the door or every Wednesday night during our small group or once a month at our um, life event. It's active. Follow up, check in, reach out. Get to know them a little bit more. So they'll know that they're cared for and this is authentic. Um, that you don't have a hidden agenda. As a group, you don't have a hidden agenda that you just genuinely care for them, each of them, each person. And reciprocal, you know, if you can ask someone to pray for you, that then begins to be a way that they can minister to you. And, and once it, there's that vulnerability, that re reciprocity, then people really begin to feel that they are cared for when you trust them with some information. So, um, boy, I really had a rough weekend. My mom fell. She's in the, in the hospital. I just really covet your prayers for myself and my family as we navigate this. show genuine concern for them. You can ask for prayer and then genuinely say, is there any way I can pray for you? Show that genuine concern for others and how they're doing. They're being cared for by you in those questions. And then we're nearing the end of the list. Befriended is the next one. And I, I put down this really the examples given by the youth and their families about befriended really talks about um, after the benediction, right? Remember invited, the first one we discussed, and I had a couple bullet points there that said it's intentional and personal to invite them. So if you're going to befriend someone, it's not just, okay, see you next Sunday. It's really talking about what you can do beyond this once a month event that you see them each month. But remember, under invited, it was intentional and personal. Invite them to do something with you, intentional and personal. And something outside of the church or wherever you typically meet for this event where you've been uh, becoming a friend and becoming a place of belonging for this person. Outside the walls of that location, Remember known, if you've done a good job of asking questions and finding out about their goals and dreams and gifts and talents and who they are, um, then you'll know, hey, asking someone who likes to go running to come to a quilting event might not be a good match. I mean, it might. You may know that about them. But be intentional about what you ask them to. And, you know, here in the Pacific Northwest where I live, we invite people for coffee. That's the first thing we do. Let's just go meet for a coffee. And that's the sort of the icebreaker, if you will. The first sort of event outside of church is to go have coffee. But we're really, really talking about and befriended. We're really talking about the other six and a half days of the week. How long does it take for you when you enter a new arena or group? Or how long does it take for someone who enters one of the groups or arenas that you are in 
to really move that relationship, that interaction even, if you don't aren't ready to call it a relationship, but to move that interaction outside of that one place where you met. How long does that take? Often takes a really long time, years, if ever. And it needs to be active. So it doesn't need to be every week or every day or every anything, but it needs to be intentional and personal outside of the walls of wherever this event is where you've met them and are, are growing that interaction and that relationship. Um, active on your part to say, hey, would you join me for X? The next to last one is needed. We all need to be needed. We all want to be needed and to be useful and to contribute. So when you can recognize worth or value by that unconditional positive regard and finding out what their interests, gifts, skills, and talents are, you can recognize their worth by saying, we have been waiting for someone just like you. We are incomplete here without you. We really need here at this life team, someone who blank, just like you told me you just did. So when the gifts are identified, and gaps or holes in your community are already identified and you can match them up, give them a role, ask early for them to contribute and let them engage when they're ready, but ask them early and encourage them, boy, you've got some real skills and gifts we could use. Man, we really are incomplete without you. We really have a hole in this area. Would love for you to consider filling that hole for us. And again, you feel needed when you're missed, when you're absent. So if somebody is absent, who's been coming regular, or even at the second time they say they're going to come or you think they'll come back and they don't, if you have contact information, follow up with them. That goes a long way towards having someone new or someone different, a person of difference, to feel as though your place is a space of safeness and a potential place of belonging for them. And the last one, the universal need, right, is to be loved. And when someone feels like your community has a genuine sense of family, that's huge, especially because of this disconnect, they may not have any other. Their family might be in another country or all the way across the, this country or even just in another state or the other side of the state and too far to get together very often, right? That genuine sense of family can be huge in addressing not only that isolation and sense of loneliness, but in creating that place of belonging um, and mutual ministry to each other. A sense of family. Gen communicating genuinely, we're in for the long haul. You're here, we're here. We're here for you. Because everything else is transitory. Remember we talked about that, Senator Sass's research that he reviewed for his idea and his proposition that there's an epidemic of loneliness is that there's a disconnect in the community of work and the community of place and because of that a disconnect in friendships and so if you can communicate some way we're in this for the long haul we're not going anywhere and you can count on us to be here that's huge in this world of a uh, very transient transitory um, way to live in america when you can communicate, again, authentically, we've got you, no matter what, we got you. And all of this communicated because of whose you are, not in spite of what you've done. We don't care about that. Because of whose you are. This is why we love. Right? As Paul tells us. Always be ready for an answer with an answer because of whose you are. So I put this screen back up again, this dimensions of belonging, because you could see them all at once. We went through each of those. I hope it wasn't too quickly for you to kind of grasp it. You're welcome to keep the PowerPoint and use it uh, and go to uh, the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center website and many of the resources that were created by the res by Dr. Carter after his research are free, downloadable, printable, and usable. Um, and I think you 
can see that these things, though they come from a pool of 500 families who live with disability, all of these things apply to everyone. We all want these dimensions of belonging in our life. And so we can use this research to really inform how we create that feeling of belonging and become a, a space and a place of belonging for others, particularly people of difference. So I hope you notice that it's really um, not rocket science, this creating a place of belonging. No special programs. You already know how to do these things. No training required, really. And maybe just some guidance on intentionality. But these are universal needs. It's about genuine, authentic relationships. But if it's not so hard, then, then what stops us? I have a couple of ideas about that. I think what stops us is that when we need to be authentic, which is a requirement for most of these things we're ask, asking and sharing that could be useful tools to create that place of belonging. When you're authentic, it means you have to be vulnerable. And that creates a sense of fear in us when we're vulnerable. Heck, we don't even like to say, I don't know what to say, let alone share something very personal and be vulnerable with someone. But unless that vulnerability and authenticity is there, the belonging will never be what it truly could be. So I think one of the things that stops us is that fear of that vulnerability and being authentic with someone. And let's face it, the fear is of some rejection based on those things. I think in the second thing that stops us is that it it might be messy. This person of difference who's so very different from me and I don't know much about, and I don't know much about their difference, let alone about them as a person, it might be messy and that makes me uncomfortable and I don't know if I wanna be uncomfortable. So I don't know if I wanna get messy. I think that's the second thing. And I think the third thing, and I'm wondering if during this pandemic, if maybe we're beginning to realize that those things that we used to spend a lot of time in are maybe not quite so as important as we thought we were. The third item I think is that it takes time. Authenticity and creating a place of belonging and authentic relationships takes time. And I know I have been guilty of feeling I have too much to do. It's all about me. I have to take care of myself. I don't have time for this. But God has called us to be that place of belonging. He's placed these people, whoever these people of difference are, in our environment. As he says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 18, God has placed each just where he chose. So I think those are the three things that stop us. And I hope some of these tools will help us to move beyond that. I think those it's that the fear of vulnerability about being authentic, the uncomfortableness of it might be messy because I don't know what I'm doing. And quite frankly, that sort of self-absorbed idea and thought that it takes time and I don't have enough time for this. But I per firmly believe we don't have anything more important to do uh, in our calling as Christians. So I'm going to share a couple more pieces of fav favorite scripture with you and then I'll sort of wrap up our time together with some specific ideas around supporting families with disability. But this is one of my um, other favorite scriptures, 1 Peter 4.10. You'll notice the green. I said, and it, it reads this way, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in all its various forms. Notice in this verse, it says each of you, not each of you except X, Y, Z, or each of you but those with A, B, C. It says each of you should use whatever gift you have received. And it says whatever gift, not that some of you don't have any, so never mind. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received 
to serve others. Being faithful stewards of God's grace in all its various forms. I love that verse. I think it's a great theme verse for this kind of discussion. And another of my favorite verses, Ephesians 2.10, and this similar sort of theme, but these are sort of affirmation of each of these themes throughout this work, um, that it really is all about how God created each of us uniquely and wonderfully, and we're placed specifically for a purpose. We have gifts to use, and he expects us to use them. And this verse says, for by grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I love that thought about workmanship, that he has crafted us with beautiful artistry. And I think this verse goes hand in hand really well with Psalm 139. So I'm going to quickly go through some resources and ideas and thoughts around supporting families with disability. If that's your specific interest, um, I'm happy to follow You can follow up with me and I'm happy to explain some more. I just want to point out that the whole family matters, not just the mom or the dad and the child or the person with a disability. Siblings, grandparents, and extended family, and the congregation is, as well. It, all of these components of the family of God matter. In children's ministry, and you'll notice this throughout, if we're talking about a child with a disability, ask what the parents want. Ask, ask, ask. Provide accommodations if necessary. Make adaptations to the regular curriculum. I'm a huge proponent of them being in classes with their age peers and moving along with their age peers so that those friendships develop over time, relationships develop over a lifetime, not keeping them in a class because we assume this is where their comprehension level ought to be. And then doing some intentional disability awareness for everyone in the class or in the school or in the Sunday school or in the church around what God says around disability, disability awareness. Youth ministry, again, ask what's needed. Invite all the youth to brainstorm how to make accommodations and be inclusive. They come up with some great ideas and they can help make suggestions about adaptations to the curriculum if needed. And one of the things all our youth struggle with, I think, is self-esteem and self-worth and who just figuring out just who they are. If we do an intentional identification of gifts and talents of everyone and then give them regular opportunities to shine using them, then the youth with a disability or a difference is just like anyone else, identifying their gifts and given opportunities to use them. Adult ministry often is a little bit more complicated, or at least we think that it is, and we make a lot of barriers around how to include an adult with a, especially an intellectual and developmental disability in the church, but helping them walk through a new member process as a rite of passage into that congregation is very helpful. It helps them connect them with others that are new to the congregation, gives them an opportunity perhaps to lead or mentor or share if they've grown up in the church and are transitioning from youth ministry into the adult ministry world. Gives them an opportunity to identify their gifts and their talents and their exper experiences that they can share. And that helps you provide opportunities for them to use them and connect with others with common interests. So what if, again, the gospel message lived out and shared by all people, not in spite of, but because of their lived experiences, somehow makes that gospel more accessible to people who will not otherwise listen. Final scripture passage I'm going to share. Just imagine. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, and I'll just read it for you because I think I'm nearing the end of my time. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So, what do you imagine?